But let me also just say, okay, even if it has to be brief, in part three, indoctrination, you cite one of my favorite authors from the 1930s, this, this British sociologist, anthropologist, J.D. Unwin, Sex and Culture, his massive work that came out back in 1936. What's going on there that we could see, even apart from faith, with regard to the sexual revolution? Yeah, the, it, it is a vast work. It, but I think there's the salient points that he came through from a vast study of all sorts of different societies is that the the greatest predictor of a flourishing society and, you know, based on, you know, various metrics, literature, farming, agriculture, um, Art, the pr music, productivity, architecture, art, music, right, yeah, right. Uh, that the greatest predictors were two things. One, is there um, a culture of normalizing uh, chastity prior to marriage? And then is there a norm of permanence ex infidelity, exclusivity in marriage? And those two things would indicate with, I think, almost un universally without fail and on all this, the societies he studied, the most uh, successful cultures. And that the ones who abandoned these norms it took about three generations. The first generations, these like new ideas start seeding their way, you know, uh, they start to let go of moral norms and particularly with regard to marriage. And then in the second generation, they, these, they really take hold. They become far more normalized. And by the third generation, the society would be so weakened, so debilitated that they were easy prey to be either taken over or to just commit societal suicide <laughs> from within. Um, and, and, you know, so I, it seems as though we're somewhere between maybe the second, third generation. It depends on how, when you, when you uh, really consider it, this, these ideas of having taken hold, probably in the 60s, late 60s, early 70s, really became, becoming mainstreamed. Um, but it does feel like a clarion call, a bit of a wake-up call. Yeah, it sure does. Reading him. Now, you cite a number of my favorite writers, uh, Paul Kangor, who's a dear friend, you know, and Kerry Gress and, and uh, Jordan Peterson as well. Um, in this treatment uh, of thought and speech control, I think you also connect the dots for people who wake up and hear the news and wonder what in the world is going on? Why is it happening? You know, and when you build your analysis upon Unwin's conclusions that prenuptial chastity on the one hand and marital fidelity on the other, just on empirical sociological grounds alone, because Unwin did never, I mean, to the best of my knowledge, he never professed Christian faith. He's just simply an honest intellectual and a sociological analyst. And the data is enough to show that within three generations of a culture restoring that sort of prenuptial chastity and marital fidelity, the consequences are cultural flourishing that produce civilizations and that sort of thing. Uh, on the other hand, if you give up on those within three or perhaps four generations, and, you know, my specialty is scripture, and I'm reminded of the Decalogue in Exodus 20, and when you break the covenant, you take God's name in vain, he will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. And in that same context, we read about how he will uh, hold accountable those who hate him to the third and fourth generation. It's not because God bears a grudge. That's exactly wrong. It's because God is patient and merciful, but he realizes that by the third or fourth generation of sin and idolatry and immorality, this stuff is so infectious, it is so catastrophic, that it isn't as though I'm just simply going to intervene and send lightning and thunder and, you know, earthquakes and volcanoes. No, there really is a warning that you self-destruct in three or four generations. And if God allows cultures to be defeated in conflict, it's precisely to prevent the spread of this uh evil contagion to other cultures as well. I think of the effect that America has through the government, through the internet, upon Africa and Asia and other people who just have much more of a traditional mindset until there's economic pressure to adopt LGBTQ agendas and that sort of thing as well.